So uh, I'm Phil. I'm a Java developer at Metal. Um, the Metal is a mobile-only business bank. And I'm here to talk with you about Pact, how we use Pact, and how we broke up our monolithic CI using Pact. So have a think about some of these statements. I have some changes I want to roll out to production that are currently in staging. At the moment, I can only deploy all the services at once, whereas I only need to deploy invoice. And the second person says, don't push pay yet, though. I need to migrate its data. We'll be doing that in the morning tomorrow. Our automated tests are taking too long. We need to start looking at parallel running. I'm sure everyone has said that at some point <laughs> in their development career. My feature tests have been broken for a while. Please, can everyone check if they push something that might have broken them? Let's get them fixed before pushing anything else. It's another familiar one. My preference moving forward is actually to push the whole thing, since that's what the successful staging artifact really means, this whole combination of versions of services. It's an interesting opinion, not my opinion. I, be, I believe we have resolved our issues in staging, so we'll be looking to do a prod deploy in the next couple of hours. Is this OK with everyone? Let me know. This will be our first prod deploy in 28 days. Now, all these um, statements were taken from our Slack before we broke up our monolithic CI. And the details have been changed to protect the innocent, but they highlight some key issues that we had. We had a rigid and inflexible release process, a process that created unnecessary dependencies between different services. Um, there was, it took a long time to release. There were checks done by informal chats and checking with others before deploying. We didn't know who or what broke the release process. And then there was long times between deploys, 28 days in that case. And this is what happens when you deliver a microservice architecture with Big Bang deployments. At Metal, we started out doing exactly this. We split up our services using domain-driven design. We use CQRS to, def to define aggregates and views. So we're doing all the right things. But at the same time every week, at the same time as the app was released, we deployed all our services to stage staging and prod at once. And this is because of how it was tested. When we cut a release for the app, we put it uh, to send it to staging users to be tested, and it was tested against a set of versions in staging. When that was distributed further to prod users, we deployed the exact set of versions in staging to prod. And that was because that was a set of versions that we knew worked with the app and worked together. So we were releasing our microservices like we were releasing a version of a mobile app. It doesn't make any sense. We also found our feature tests taking a long time. They were testing things that we uh, didn't change. Um, they were testing uh, because every um, feature test would run after every deploy. So, yes, that's fine. <laughs> this is a holding slide. Uh, this is uh, mostly going to be talking. I've got some uh, like visualizations. So, yeah, just uh, focus on me. <laughs> I'll bring you through. Bring you through the story. Um, the problem is we were testing service compatibility along with, at the same time, as service functionality. So we wanted to be in a place where we could test those things independently, compatibility independently of functionality, where we could deploy changes little and often straight into production, and where we were confident that different services work together at different versions. We wanted to get to the point where people weren't unnecessarily blocked delivering features because they were waiting for other services to go to prod where if something did go wrong, we knew exactly what change had caused it, and uh, there was only one small change to roll back. So this is a new problem which requires a new solution. We have to embrace the fact that our uh, testing of microservices shouldn't be done in the monolithic way. Our building of services changed. We, we add circuit breakers and message queues. We had uh, exponential backoffs and retries, all things that we didn't use to use as much when building monoliths. And so if the uh, creation of microservices has created some new problems with new solutions, then also the testing of microservices also requires some new solutions. So the first thing we did was just, we split out our deployments. Uh, we made them independently deployable and independently testable. So let me show you what our CI used to look like. This is a monolithic deploy. Um, so the services would all be built independently. On the left, they would go through some security checks, deploy to dev independently. Then all of the feature tests would be run after every deploy to dev. Then all of the, te all of the dev services that were in dev when the feature tests pass would be an input to the staging deploy. 
and this is like a manually triggered deploy that would deploy all of the services at the latest versions that had uh, passed the dev feature tests into stage. The same would happen again. You'd run all of the test feature tests against staging and then deploy all of the servers against prod. And you can see why this is attractive. It's stable, but it's also cumbersome. It's prohibitive. It's uh, difficult to coordinate releases with. So we started splitting it out, put um, services into their own pipelines, took them out of the massive deploy, and we kept on, kept on going and going and going, getting rid of more and more, slim it down, slim it down, and it's gone. So you can see that was us splitting out our services, uh, but we still couldn't turn on automatic prod deploys. Um, and that's, um, that's because we had no confidence that the services we were about to deploy would integrate correctly with the services in the next environment. In previous projects, I would use, before raising a pull request, I would run all of the services in Docker containers, databases and everything on my laptop before I made that pull request, just to make sure that everything still worked together. And I got away with this for a really long time because there were actually weren't that many services. Not sure I was really doing microservices then. And when I came to Metal, it obviously doesn't scale. And I was like, should I have bought more RAM for my MacBook or something? Like, I can't run all of these services together. And that's one example of a bad solution to this problem, which is running all, the all of the real services in an environment. It might be Docker, it might be Kubernetes, it might be Docker Swarm. Um, but it's really resource intensive, and it's difficult to set up. Another solution to this might be to use mock services. So you have a service that you're changing, and you run it at the latest version, and you um, create mocks for all the services that it integrates with. But this, and this is less resource intensive, but it's even harder to set up. And how do you make sure that mocks are returning the right responses according to what the other services are doing? The better solution to this is contracts. And contracts are everywhere, and they always have been. Contracts are implicit in the conversations that you have with uh, your coworkers when you're building microservices. Uh, they're also implicit in the types that you use, if you're using a strongly typed language with a monolith. So the first contract we implemented was Avro for all our Kafka messages. Uh, so we set up schema registries in every environment. Uh, we set up a Spring Boot starter to register our Java objects as schemas in the schema registry. We set up our schema registries to be backwards compatible. So you could only add new fields if you made it nullable or gave it a default value. This meant that any old messages could always be serialized into the new format. So this meant that we couldn't deploy um, a service that was incompatible because as it tries to um, start up, it would try to register the new schema. If it was incompatible, schema registry would say 409, there's a been a conflict, and the app wouldn't start up. The second contract we implemented was Pact. Avro was for all our Kafka messages, and Pact was for all our HTTP communication. So Pact is an implementation of consumer-driven contracts. And uh, other implementations exist, such as Spring Cloud Contract, but we chose Pact because it's been around since about 2013, and it has multiple language bindings, of which we needed Java and uh, JavaScript. So let's talk about what Pact is and how, uh, and how it works before we talk about how we used it. So in Pact, there are two Pactisicipants. That's participants for Pact. Um, there's a consumer and it defines the contracts. And a contract is simply uh, has the provider name and the consumer name, and it says, when I make this request, I expect this response. So it'll be a request with this path and this method, this body, I want, and I'm expecting this response with this body. This is published to the Pact broker with the version of the consumer. So we use Git hashes for all the versions of our um, Pactisicipants. So this meant that we can know exactly what Git commit created what pact in the pact broker. A provider verifies contracts. So it will, in its pact tests, pull down all of the pacts that it is a part of. It will run the requests in the pact against itself and then check that the response that it provides is the same as the response that is expected in the pact. This comparison is uploaded to the pact broker as a verification. So you can have failed and successful verifications. The pack broker is simply a data store of your participants, their versions, the packs, and the verifications. And the pack broker is used to determine in CI are two versions of services compatible. It has a particular function called can I deploy? 
and that's used uh, just before you deploy. You ask the broker, can I deploy this service with, at this version to this environment? And it asks, for all of the, um, for this version of the service, are there successful verifications for all the packs that it is a part of um, with the versions of the services in the next environment? So you can see the data that's based off in the packed matrix. And the packed matrix, this is a screen grab from a packed broker. Packed matrix is simply a table of consumer name, consumer version, provider, provider name, and whether they're integrating. There's lots of successful verifications there. So these two versions would be allowed to be deployed into the same environment. So if can I deploy is enabled, this particular gate, which allows us to move into the next environment, how does a, um, how does a service with PACT enabled move through all the environments? So for a provider, it will build, and then after building, it will run its PACT tests against the master version of the consumer. And then just before deploying to dev and to staging and to prod, it will run the PACT tests against the dev uh, version of the PACTS and the staging version of the PACTS and the prod version of the PACTS. And this means that the verifications will be there before it asks, can I deploy? For a consumer, uh, the PACT is published when it's building. So that, and the arrival of a new PACT in the PACT broker kicks off a number of tasks in the CI to uh, check out the provider at the dev, staging, and prod versions and run the pack tests. So it's checking that for this new pack that's arrived, do all of the providers still integrate correctly? And the consumer is waiting while those pack tests happen. And then once they've run, it can ask, can I deploy? So where Pact really shines is where you have different versions of services in different environments. I'm going to show you just an example of how uh, services would move through different environments. So we've got a consumer at version one in all three environments, provider at version one, all three environments. It's uh, a person service, so it provides person data. It's got a first name and surname. And we've got a successful verification between version ones of both the services. So the consumer wants to change the name of a required field. Effectively, we're removing one field and adding another field. So it changes surname to last name. It builds, publishes the contract to the pack broker, and that starts off a task in CI to check out the provider at the dev staging and prod version, which is all version one. Version one doesn't pro provide that field, so failed verification is uploaded, and it can't deploy to dev, because it's incompatible. Then the provider provides the new field and the old field. It has a new version. It uh, builds, it'll run the pack tests against the master version of the consumer, which is version two. Uh, that, will, that will pass because it provides the new field. Then just before deploying into dev, it runs against the dev version of the consumer's pack, which is version one. It still provides the old field as well, so that passes too. Now we can deploy the uh, provider through all of the environments. So that's, uh, that's the provider in all three environments. Now the consumer, because it has a su successful verification between the um, provider in the dev uh, environment and the version you want to deploy, version two, it can also deploy through all of the environments. But imagine a staging feature test fails, and it only gets as far as staging. And then the provider team come along, and they actually want to clean up uh, an old field. Uh, so they want to get rid of surname. They create a new version, uh, it builds, it'll only be, um, it will run against the latest version of the consumer pact, it will pass because it provides the new field, but it'll only be, be able to deploy it as far as staging. Because when it gets to prod, it'll run against those pack tests against the prod version of the consumer, which is version one, it doesn't provide the old field, it will fail and it won't be able to deploy to prod. This is where Pact is stuffing us deploying incompatible versions of services. To fix this, you just need to make sure that consumer goes through to prod, and then uh, the version three of the provider can go through as well. Since this is consumer driven, um, consumers write their contracts first. And um, so it can be very easy to break the provider's build if consumers don't talk to the provider team first. So it requires a lot of collaboration. And deciding to use Pact must be a whole team thing. It must, all the team must be involved because it requires so much more collaboration. The ideal collaboration would be for consumer and provider team to talk design first, to agree a contract, for the uh, consumer team to publish a new Pact to the Pact broker without any tags so it doesn't break the provider's build. 
Um, the provider can then use that to implement and make sure that they meet the pact. And the consumer team can also uh, continue to implement their service uh, meeting that pact. Then the provider uh, deploys through all the environments, and then the consumer deploys through all the environments. And this may seem like a lot of work. I can see it, see it in your eyes. This is like extra work for you guys. But it highlights the underlying requirement that a consumer cannot be deployed until a provider provides everything it needs. It's forcing you into, uh, to being uh, smarter about how you release and making non-breaking changes. Sometimes this means making the things on the provider optional while the consumer catches up. So as with any tool, there are times when uh, Pact is useful and um, good, it's a good solution, and at times when it's unhelpful. So uh, when you, where you should use Pact is where you own and write both consumer and provider, and where the interactions are truly consumer-driven. So the times where you shouldn't use Pact are for functional testing. So Pact should only be used for testing all the different interactions. It shouldn't be used for testing what happens after that interaction or before that interaction. It, should only be used, um, it shouldn't be used for third party or pass through services. So if you're integrating with a third party, you shouldn't use Pact for that, um, that interaction because you don't own both sides of the, of the interaction. And lastly, you shouldn't use Pact um, to test non-consumer driven interactions. So for example, OAuth. All of the interactions are already defined in the spec, and they're not changing that often. So there's no point using Pact there. So just there's a couple of t uh, tips and facts about Pact that I learned, which I found really helpful. Consumers only publish contracts. Providers only verify contracts. Services can be both a consumer or a provider, or both. Um, don't test authentication or authorization in your Pacts when you start doing this. And lastly, what you test in Pact is not totally defined. It is a team decision, uh, but you should try and test all the different types of interactions. Um, so it's, it's a continual learning process about what and should and shouldn't you add into your Pact tests. So how did we get there? How did we, um, uh, what was our Pact journey? So yeah, we started out splitting out all our services. We made them independently deployable and testable. We then set up a Pact broker in our CI environment to be used by CI to check our two versions of services compatible. We then started writing contracts from the consumer side, published them to the Pact broker without any tags. Then we wrote provider tests to make sure that those contracts were being fulfilled by our providers. The providers were then deployed through all the environments and then the consumers. And we started out doing this with just two services at a time. Um, so we didn't do all our Pact tests in one go. I'd recommend doing the same, just do a little spike and grow. Don't try and do uh, pack tests for your whole ecosystem in one go. In parallel with writing the pack tests, we um, set up the CI infrastructure. And this is really important to get the CI infrastructure correct. There's obviously a lot of tasks that need to run to make sure that all the verifications are there to enable, can I deploy to work correctly? So that means you need to make sure that consumers publish packs to the pack broker. You need to make sure that providers uh, run pack tests against the master, dev, staging, and prod versions of the packs. You need to make sure that any time a new pack arrives in the pack broker, that the dev, staging, and prod versions of the uh, provider's pack tests are also run to make sure that a consumer can deploy and it has the verifications available. Lastly, you need to make sure that you tag any version of a service that, get deploys, that gets deployed to an environment so that Pact Broker knows what versions of the services are in each environment. So after doing that, next was to turn on the automatic, uh, or turn on the can I deploy steps. So once everything has been deployed, we can start turning on these gates and making sure that nothing goes through without having successful integrations and verifications that they are correct. After that, we turned on automatic pod deploys. So we did this, again, two servers at a time, write pack tests, turn on can I deploy, then turn on automatic prod deploys. And our, serv and our releases went from being every week and taking a few hours to being every time we commit and taking half an hour from commit to production. So the migration from monolithic delivery to microservice delivery is not that complicated. It doesn't have that many steps. It is simply make sure that your services are independently deployable and testable. Set up the CI infrastructure, including a broker. Make sure you put time into that. Write consumer tests and then provider tests. And enable gates 
uh, to stop deployments if there, is, uh, if there isn't a verified version match. The thing that takes the time is writing the consumer tests because they're setting up the requests, they're setting up the responses and all the ex expectations, and particularly setting up the CI infrastructure. We, we went through a number of iterations around the CI infrastructure to get that correct, and I would really recommend that you um, put time into that to make sure that you, don't get that, that you get that right, because if you don't have that set of right, developers get annoyed, they won't like PACT, they'll stop writing PACT tests, and it'll, the whole um, like endeavor will be in vain. So the final step would be to uh, remove any integration tests, which are slowing your delivery down and adding no value. Um, so anything that's just testing compatibility rather than functionality. So you've heard about always try striving to make your PR small. And this is why I feel like you should do, be doing prod deployments all the time. A lot of the same benefits apply to um, delivering those changes into prod. So if you make a small change, something goes wrong, you know exactly what change caused it. And when you want to make your service stable again, you only have one change to roll back. And when you want to fix that thing that you've just rolled back, you only have a small amount of code to look in to find where you should be fixing it. I can remember many deployments going wrong in previous projects because we would wait weeks between coding and deployment. And we'd forget any steps that needed to be done uh, before deployment, and the deployment would then go wrong. Um, so the main downside of PACT is simply that it's, um, it's quite complicated. I've glossed over quite a lot of stuff here, and um, I really recommend just delving into the docs. Um, it's really important if you do take it on as a team uh, that you share that knowledge as much as possible. We had loads of back-end sessions uh, to share knowledge about PACT, about how we use it, how we should use it, um, and why it's good. Um, so sharing that knowledge and just delving into the documentation is, is really useful because there are a lot of different moving parts to it. But I think contract testing is an integral part of any successful microservice system. Um, it's really good at enabling you to deliver things independently and um, for you to know that different versions of services work together and you can be confident that you're deploying something that's gonna work before you even deploy it. So key takeaways are if you're gonna use Pact, uh, Please uh, make sure that the whole team is involved. Uh, make time for setting up pack tests in CI. If you're building microservices, but test them, testing them like a monolith, consider using contract testing. I, I think of it as like microservice-aware testing. If you're moving to microservices, consider how you're going to, de to deliver them. So there's been a really interesting theme running around throughout the whole conference, um, which is how do I safely integrate loosely coupled services? And the point of microservices, as Hugh was saying earlier this morning, is to uh, speed up the rate of innovation. By being able to um, independently involve services at a fast pace, you can try, test, change, and add features rapidly. But the key is being able to deliver services independently. And the way that you test services will determine how you deliver them. Thanks. So I have about a minute and a half for any questions. Hey. Your team. So how to find the boundaries of what actually we need to test through pack tests? I mean, okay, it's okay to test the payload. Is it okay to test the error code, uh, you know? Mm. Yeah, really good question. Yeah, uh, that's something that we're, st we're still working out. Um, I would say if the format of that error response is important to your consumer, then yes, test it. Not necessarily, I wouldn't test like the messages in it, I would just test that, okay, if you have an error payload with status, message, detail, title maybe, just test that all those keys are there. And if the consumer is using each one of those, then it's really important to make sure that, yeah, when an error occurs, that all th that those four keys are there. Thank you. Anyone else? Cool, thank you very much. I'll be down here for any other questions, but enjoy the rest of your day.